Hello everyone, welcome to the Rumi Forum. Today we have a uh, special guest, uh, Max Finberg, and we're honored to have uh, each and every one of you. Max Finberg was, uh, has dedicated his career to serving others, especially hungry people. He has a wide range of experience in the government and non-profit areas. In May 2009, he was appointed by Secretary of Agriculture to direct USDA's Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Housed in the Office of the Secretary, the Center's mission is to build partnerships between USDA and faith-based and neighborhood organizations to serve individuals, families, and communities. Previously, he was the first director of the Alliance to End Hunger a non-profit organization that engages diverse institutions in building the public in building the public will to end hunger both in the United States and worldwide. Prior to joining the Alliance, Mr. Finberg served, um, served Ambassador and former representative Tony Hall for 12 years in a variety of capacities. He was special agent to the Ambassador at the US Mission to the UN Agencies for Food and Agriculture in Rome, Italy. Mr. Finberg was also Senior Legislative Assistant covering domestic hunger and poverty issues for Representative Hall. Mr. Finberg graduated with honours from Howard University School of Divinity with a master's degree in social ethics. He lives in DC uh, with his wife Katie and two children. Thank you very much, Max. We will be discussing issues regarding to regarding uh, feeding the uh, the hungry, particularly from an interfaith uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. I leave it to you to give us your introduction, please, and welcome again. Thank you. Well, thank you, Emery, for having me, and thank you folks for joining us and it, it is exciting to be able to <clears throat> think back on my own life and what's brought me here and how that connects with so many of our brothers and sisters around the world but uh, as shared before but uh, I have a Christian mom and a Jewish father and so interfaith has been part of my life from the beginning. It's part of my DNA and to have the President of the United States give one of his top priorities to the entire faith-based initiative to be around promoting interfaith dialogue and cooperation has been a perfect fit. So it's been a, a thrill, it's been exciting to be part of the President Obama's team at the U.S. Department of Agriculture where we serve people every day and every way and there are great examples of how folks are able to connect with the programs and priorities that we have that I'm excited to share a little about. But as I mentioned to you earlier, Emre, I spent a junior year of high school abroad. I was able to travel to Germany and spend the year learning through a, a program that the US government and the German government had to develop cultural understanding. And you know, I hadn't taken any German, I didn't know anything really about the country, about the education system, all that. So thrown into it with a month of German language and culture training and forced to swim, you do. And people naturally are able to come to an understanding, come to recognize that people are the same, and that's what I did. I had a great experience, so much so I went back in college and for me, coming from a small town of about 700 folks in the mountains of rural upstate New York, to have an understanding from the beginning that the world was a bigger place uh, was a great way, foundation to then go on into life. It was also as part of that that uh, my Christian grandparents sent me to Israel with my Jewish uncle as part of both sides of my heritage. It was a discovery for me of what the Holy Land was about and what it was, some of the history. I didn't, didn't know what to think. There wasn't a theology there, but it started a foundation of their, their people who are motivated by their faith to care about <coughs> others. So came back and started reading in the Bible from the book of Genesis on to Revelation and again discovered here's a foundation for people who so believe to care for others. Mm -hmm. Couldn't get around it. There were verse after verse 
talking about caring for the widow, for the orphan, leaving the edges of your fields so that they could come along and at least have something to eat. And then fast forward a while and in my professional career have come in, into contact with folks from different faiths. And that started a process for me of understanding the spiritual foundation that motivates a great many people in our world to care for others. So it was a few years ago, uh, and my first effort worked with some Muslim organizations to be a part of the Interfaith Convocation Against Hunger uh, at the National Cathedral. And I remember learning s my, from an Imam some of the first parts of the Quran that have stuck with me ever since. And he talked about a, a chapter or a surah uh, in the Quran called El Ma'ida and described what that meant and the spread table, much like we were able to enjoy today here at the Rumi Forum, was, was the Prof, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him, talking about us dining together. And that was what started me in a, a search for, well, what else might the Quran have to say? What else are, are Muslims doing and have gone on from there? But, so I wanted to share, if I might, a couple mm. of the verses that I found particularly poignant in, in my search for what's, what's appropriate, what's this foundation? So one is, those that give their wealth for the cause of God can be compared to a grain of corn which brings forth seven years, each bearing a hundred grains. So that's from the cow, or the table as it's translated in the imperfect English we got to deal with, is vie with each other in good works. For to God you shall all return, and He will resolve for you your differences. And then uh, one from the pilgrimage, talking about the Hajj, where it says, eat of their flesh, the cattle, not the people, eat of their flesh and feed the poor and unfortunate. So that for me was a, the beginning exposure of this is common beyond what I was familiar with in Christianity or Judaism. And then sort of continuing on from there, the, uh, the golden rule as it's often referred to in Christianity finds itself there in, in Buddhist traditions as well. So, do as you would want done to you, said the Buddha. Or the Upanishads for the Hindus had something very similar. Let him never turn away a stranger from his house. That is the rule. Therefore, a man should by all means acquire much food. For good people say to the stranger, there is food ready for him. If he gives food amply, food is given to him amply. If he gives food fairly, food is given to him fairly. And if he gives food meanly, food is given to him meanly. So that was the spiritual foundation. But then culturally, everybody eats. Everybody eats what they are familiar with. And then as you get exposed to different cultures, you expand your culinary tastes and skills and that leads to even more understanding, promotion of a common dialogue and otherwise over the table of food, over the spread table. So I think about my daughter Eliana in her kindergarten class where about a third of the students are white but half of them have European parents, so Ukraine and Germany and England but a third are African or African-American, so Ghana and Ethiopia and Senegal are represented there, and then a third Asian or Latin American or a mixed heritage that's just amazing for a kindergartner that I never had growing up. Mm. That's the foundation that I have come to understand exists for wanting to eat and wanting to help those who cannot eat. So it's a perfect place to be at the United States Department of Agriculture talking about and doing what we can to help those who are hungry. In the United States of America, richest country in the history of the world, we have 50 million of our brothers and sisters who don't always get enough to eat. About 17 million kids who don't always know where their next meal is coming from. They're not starving. It's not the same as some of the 
photos we see from famine stricken areas, but a million kids skip meals because they have to, not because they're dieting or not because it's the fashionable thing to do, but because they have no other choice. And then around the world, we have about 925 million hungry brothers and sisters. So just shy of a billion, but one out of six and a half people on this planet mm. struggling to eat. So insert then what we can do together. And from the government's perspective, it's exciting to see a, a coordination that's been happening and that's happening even more so in the Obama administration. One thing in particular is the, the international effort called Feed the Future. So at feedthefuture.gov, you'll have a, an amazing initiative of the whole of government. So USDA, our colleagues at the State Department, the US Agency for International Development, all of the, the players that are working overseas on development are taking a role in agricultural development and nutrition. And it's exciting to see that there's a potential focus of 20 countries that are the most in need, so in Africa and Asia and Latin America especially, and the focus is, one, it needs to be comprehensive. So it's not just the model of <coughs> United States food aid as has existed in the past. Two, it needs to be country-led. We need to have the countries themselves and some of their civil society partners contributing to the, the ideas that they have. And it also needs to be multilateral, so working with the United Nations, with the World Bank, with others to make sure that folks are engaged in, in that. And again, agriculture development as well as nutrition, especially for young people. So one of the great programs that the USDA has as part of this mix is named after two of our great statesmen, George McGovern and Bob Dole, International Food for Education and Child Nutrition Program. <coughs> Long name, but basically it's school lunch overseas. And we are doing great stuff through our non-governmental partners and the UN's World Food Program to deliver food for kids at school. So I come back to that image of El Ma'id, of the spread table. And I think about what kids are doing at school throughout Sub-Saharan Africa or uh, South Asia or Central America. And the meal that they get at school is making sure that they can learn. It's helping attract them to school because their parents are saying, I know my kid's at least going to get one solid meal. And it's even starting to demonstrate some impact in their educational achievement as it does here in the US. So Feed the Future is a great, great initiative that's looking at how we collectively can help others overseas. And just a few weeks ago, together with the faith-based center at USAID, we convened a consultation with faith-based NGOs and nonprofit organizations about Feed the Future. And some of those groups have been part of those conversations for a long time. Some of them have USAID grants or contracts. Others are familiar but hadn't really heard what the program was or how to plug in. And then we had a whole other group, Emre, that had never been around a table like that. They hadn't been included in those conversations. So to have the, the Buddhists and the Hindus there for the first time <coughs> to have Islamic relief there uh, in a way that they hadn't been before, but also to have some of the mega churches, the big churches that are doing overseas work, but have never partnered with government to be a little more effective. It was a wonderful example of what convening people from uh, different backgrounds can, can bring to bear. Mm. Then switching gears to domestically, here in the United States, following World War II, uh, President Truman said, because he'd heard from his generals that there was a problem drafting people for the Second World War because of malnutrition, created the National School Lunch Program 
1946 as a, as a national security priority. Mm. And out of that has grown a number of different programs that are our nutrition assistance programs. They form the safety net for people in the United States so that there wouldn't be widespread hunger. And we're very blessed and fortunate there isn't malnutrition on the, those clinical levels that we see elsewhere around the mm. world. So the, we have school lunch, now we have school breakfast. Thanks to the President signing the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act last month, we now have after school supper programs that are also the government's contribution to reaching these kids. We also have what used to be called the food stamp program, now the supplemental nutrition assistance program that helps people with money to buy groceries mm -hmm. so that they can put food on the table for their kids. We have the Women, Infants, and Children program or WIC program to target pregnant women. Uh, your four-month-old daughter um, would qualify in terms of age, but there also income there. It's a nutrition assistance program. It's targeted toward those who need it. And at this stage in the United States, one out of two babies born participates in the WIC program. Mm. 49%, so it's one out of every two babies is benefiting from the nutrition assistance that comes from this program. So again, we have an array of programs that are designed to help. <coughs> But we can't do it alone. President Obama, Secretary Vilsack are very clear that the federal government cannot do something like ending child hunger in the United States alone, cannot do the project that Feed the Future has alone. And that's why we need partners. And it's exciting in my role to reach out to partners, work with some existing partners that can use a little more help here or there, but to also bring new partners to the table, folks that have never been engaged. So I'm excited that uh, for the second year in a row, we'll be working with Islamic Relief to get the word out on some of our summer feeding programs. During the school year, kids come to school and we feed 32 million of them for lunch. For breakfast, about 11 million kids get school breakfast. But during the summer, when school's out, only about 3 million kids are able to get those free meals. And that's because we need partners. So looking for civic organizations, boys and girls clubs, mosques, synagogues, congregations, temples, churches, doesn't matter. We have ways of partnering together where if you have kids there, we can get meals there. And so it's exciting to see some new partners come to the table that haven't before. And with that, I would just uh, like to thank Rumi Forum, but also ask for your help. And you guys who are also in, involved and active in doing some of this outreach to immigrant communities that might not be so amenable to hearing from the federal government. Hi, I'm here to help you doesn't quite work with everyone. But as a community partner, you are the trusted intermediary. When the imam or when the pastor or when the priest or when the rabbi says, it's okay, <coughs> that opens doors for partnership with our programs that might not have existed before. So I'm particularly hopeful that we can continue to set the table, that it can be a full table, and that all of God's children can come and have something to eat around it. So both in terms of the physical food, but also in terms of the access, the dialogue, the conversation, and then the cooperation that come out of that is a perfect tie-in with what President Obama has been talking about of promoting interfaith dialogue and cooperation. So with that, Emre, I thank you and looking forward to some questions. Thank you, uh, Max. If I may, uh, just go back to that uh, initial statistic. It's quite a phenomenal amount, 50 million people, of which 17 million are, are, are children, uh, don't have enough uh, to eat on a day-to-day -day basis. What are the, the reasons for, for this? <laughs> is quite a phenomenal amount, uh, one-sixth right. or yeah. maybe uh, one-fifth of, uh, of Americans are, are in this dilemma. Right. 
Well, what are the main reasons the primary, for this? Primary reason, primary cause of hunger, or to use the technical term here, food insecurity, is poverty. If you hit a bump in the road or something goes wrong and you have enough money to take care of it, your kids aren't going hungry. But if that happens, if you lose your job, if uh, a divorce or mm -hmm. an illness or an accident happen, one of the things that often goes is food. Not for extended periods of time, we all know we need food to eat, but when you have the choice, do I pay my electricity bill this year, so I can, or this month, or do I spend more on groceries, that's not an easy choice. Same with senior citizens who might have to buy prescription drugs or otherwise. So the, the primary cause is poverty. And there are a number of anti-poverty programs that also are, are there to help. But what we find is that the community partners, the faith-based organizations, the nonprofits that are there to provide a box of food to, to get folks over the tough times are amazing. Those folks are, are the salt of the earth and doing the work that they're, they're seeing right in front of them. So the people come in and I'm hungry now, well, it can't be, well, let's wait and see what happens. It's getting fed now, so providing those folks with the immediate response and tied in with access to the federal programs is the answer. You'll also find other causes in there, but one of the, the misnomers is that folks who are hu homeless are the hungry population. Obviously, mm -hmm. with numbers like that, it's much bigger. So the gentleman on the street corner asking for change is a very, very small percentage mm -hmm. of those who are hungry. And associated alcohol or drug abuse, again, is very, very small in terms of the, the folks who are hungry or threatened by hunger, and especially kids. Mm -hmm. How can you hold them fully responsible for their parents' irresponsibility or bad choices in order to break the cycle, we need to make sure we're reaching the kids in, in more and better ways than we're doing now. And how has uh, the policies uh, changed since the new administration has, has started uh, compared to previous administrations? And really historically, over the uh, past few decades, if it's possible to, to make a generalization. Mm -hmm. uh, and then where are we headed? Uh, in the in the long term, are there five year goals, ten year, right, ten year goals, Max? The Obama administration has done a great job in strengthening our nutrition assistance program. So, for the American Relief and Recovery Act, for the stimulus bill, there was an injection of about twenty billion dollars into our supplemental nutrition assistance program to increase those benefits because of the economic turmoil and necessity. And over the past few couple years, those benefits have been a big part of why that number isn't even bigger. Uh, the reality is that people are, sp we're able to track that they're spending their benefits within the first three, four weeks of, or two to three weeks of, of getting them. 98% of them are expended within the month. That money has an economic stimulative effect. So for every $5 of, of the program that you can spend on a card, just like our my credit card or debit mm -hmm. card, and that cuts down on waste, fraud, and abuse, but for every $5, there's almost double that, $9.20 of economic activity. You spend it at the grocery store. Well, people at the grocery store benefit from that because they have jobs. People that are providing the food that goes to be stocked on the shelves and shipping that, all of that means that this is something that conservative and liberal economists agree was a great way to stimulate the economy. Mm -hmm. The administration's done that. As I mentioned last month, uh, thanks to Congress doing its part, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act will be the first major investment in decades in our school meals programs, in our school nutrition programs. So, if you are providing uh, healthier food, uh, higher quality, nutritious food, you'll get a, an increased reimbursement. 
as I mentioned, there's this new after-school supper program that existed in a few states that's now nationwide. Uh, some of the ways of cutting out paperwork and some of the red tape so that kids would be able to be qualified and on these programs are taken away. Um, so that's a great step forward. But historically, it's also interesting to see these programs have enjoyed bipartisan support for generations. As I mentioned, George McGovern and Bob Dole, different parties, one ran for president under the Democrats and one ran for president under the Republicans, and they've worked together on hunger issues for their entire careers. You see that still with members of Congress cooperating across the political aisles to preserve some of these programs, to uh, expand and improve them. Um, my former boss, Congressman Tony Hall, was a Democrat who worked with a couple of his closest friends on the Republican side to make sure that these programs domestically and internationally had the support they needed. So that, mm -hmm. I think, is a great illustration that the Obama administration is doing some terrific stuff in terms of expanding and improving these programs, but it's building on a, a long-term historical bipartisan commitment that these are an important investment we make in our kids. And towards the future, what are we looking at in terms of improving? And what are the major hurdles? Mm -hmm. or what are the ideals? What is the, what is the perfect scenario for someone in your position? Right. The Obama administration has made a commitment and talked with Secretary Vilsack at the very beginning of his tenure on working with kids and improving the access and quality of the, the food that kids get. And part of that, the down payment of that, was the school meals improvement, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. But now it's what more can we do together? Again, it, government had to do its part to increase access and quality to these programs. Now we need to work with partners, work with the corporate sector and businesses, work with the nonprofit sector and civil society, work with faith groups in an even bigger way to make sure that children especially, but everybody are accessing these programs. So the goal of uh, tackling that childhood hunger in particular is one that we're focused on and looking for partnerships uh, across the board to be able mm -hmm. to tackle. And in regards to your uh, international presence, mm -hmm. Uh, what are the priorities there? Who do you choose? What are the criteria by which certain communities or, or countries uh, are serviced or assisted? Right. When President Obama was inaugurated, as part of his speech, he talked about to the people of the developing world, we promise to work with you to help your farms flourish, to provide clean water, to feed hungry minds and nourish starving bodies. And growing out of that has been cooperation across government to target it. And that's also led with to international cooperation. So the G8, when they met in Italy a couple years ago, came together and said this is a top priority. The G20 have addressed this as well. So it's, it's a great thing that America is leading, but there are other partners in this. So that uh, has meant a three and a half billion dollar pledge over the next few years from the United States as part of a much larger 20 plus billion dollar package to address this. The countries were, the focus countries that we have on the potential list were chosen primarily because of need, but also because of capacity of the government to work with us as, as partners. So not every hungry country is in a situation that would allow for uh, expanded interventions in agricultural development or nutrition, conflict, civil war, mm -hmm. things like that. But the feedthefuture.gov website has a list of the 20 countries, again, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Central Asia, and Central America that were chosen with the countries in, in, in consultation as well as some of our multilateral partners and uh, other donors. Thank you. And if I may uh, open up to our guests, uh, those of you that have a question or two, if you could please state your name and your affiliation, it would be appreciated both to the audience here and our audience at home. 
Thank you, Director Feinberg, for your uh, presentation. My name is Jihad Saleh, and I'm with Islamic Relief USA. Um, I have a question that, that you can help <coughs> answer from both your experiences previously mm -hmm. as uh, the head of, uh, director of one of the leading advocacy organizations for the anti-poverty organization and food relief, mm -hmm. and also your role currently in uh, Department of Agriculture. Uh, can you give us some uh, uh, scale of the U.S. government, our president, and Congress have, are proving lo upon laws, that, as you mentioned, for your children, help families in need, but, and so the government is playing their role uh, in with the poverty the United States. But what percentage or what degree are nonprofit community-based organizations are the first line of defense? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is the percentage of breakdown of community-based organizations, NGOs, really implementing, the, implementing these type of programs, whether through their own charitable donations that they raise or through grants that they're receiving from the government? Because mm -hmm. as you mentioned, uh, the president has said that the U.S. government cannot do it alone. And then also, uh, can you please maybe speak from your past experience in directing these type of organizations? Uh, what, what are these organizations missing? What is also their future to improve, um, to help in their, their partnership with the U.S. government to deal with the problem of poverty and insec uh, food insecurity in the United States? Mm -hmm. There are thousands of those charities that form the, the tapestry that is the uh, emergency food response network. You have uh, small pantries, you have feeding programs to the tune of maybe 60,000 around the country. The network that helps bring those together for the immediate term is Feeding America. Feeding America has more than 200 food banks. Think of them as the wholesale level and it would be the agencies or the the congregation-based pantry or the feeding program that's the retail. That's where the food gets to the people. That's where the table is set. That's where hungry people are fed. About two-thirds of those are faith-based, motivated by what we talked about earlier in terms of their spiritual foundation to provide for those in need. Some of them are doing that just on their own. And this is where I would, would say the, the room for growth exists. Many of them are volunteer-led and driven, don't have a lot of time and capacity, but connecting with the nutrition assistance programs is the way to make it sustainable. So I was just talking with a uh, faith-based organization here in D.C. the other day, and they give out boxes of groceries, <coughs> but they hadn't been to asking folks if they were registered for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program or putting in information or flyers into those bags or boxes, like others do. And so that's, that's an easy first step to make sure that when you're meeting the immediate need, there's a step after that to connect them with the programs that do exist that we run with our state partners to make sure that there's something more sustainable. One of the other things I've found is that the moral voice of the community is powerful. And it might not be that that comes with lobbying or legislative might, but the moral voice to make sure that we're standing up for our hungry children, that uh, kids are doing paper plate letters to elected officials to let them know the importance of these programs, that the, the leaders of faith or denominations or religious communions or nonprofit organizations are raising their voices on behalf of those they're serving in a big way. I, another example of one of the largest evangelical mega churches in the country is in Chicago in the suburbs outside of Chicago. They are the largest feeding agency of the food bank. Food bank has hundreds of different agencies and this one church is the largest distribution point for them. And they're, despite being a predominantly white church, they're serving a predominantly Latino population through some of their programs. So that's given rise to their pastor and their congregation being involved in immigration an issue that might not have been on their radar screen before and pushing for comprehensive immigration reform. Um, there have been a number of agencies that have gone 
the next step beyond here's the box of groceries to how can I treat the person as a guest walking in with dignity? How can I help them to the next level? A lot of that is partnership with our programs. Yeah. And if I may interject with a, mm -hmm. a question that's just uh, come to mind is, have you seen cooperation between cultural and or faith-based communities as a result of partnering with uh, your department increase? Has there been any uh, mutual projects come about as a result or have they worked collectively together for each other's communities or has there been that type of intercultural interfaith uh, relationship building? Mm -hmm. We've definitely seen an increase in that and through the White House initiative on faith-based and neighborhood partnerships some of my colleagues have worked very very diligently on expanding interfaith service opportunities. Mm. So a great example was the Muslim Student Association at a college, the Hillel, the Jewish students, and the youth group from a Protestant church all came together to do a service project. That was a fabulous illustration of what can happen. We see that especially around hunger where there's no theological differences or disagreements mm. there. And the expansion of that cooperation, that understanding. Uh, so there's been a lot of emphasis on interfaith service uh, around college campuses. There's been work with service organizations to make sure they're reaching out to faith communities. Interfaith Youth Corps has been a very big partner in getting the word out and helping to set up some of these where there might, might have been a <coughs> spark or a willingness. Um, Disasters are another good illustration. When the mudslides hit, when the forest fire, when the hurricane, they don't discriminate based on color, ethnic origin, religion, anything. Mm. So to see in response to the floods in Nashville, uh, Muslims, Jews, Christians coming together to work side by side, to have seen that on the Gulf Coast, um, has been a, a wonderful treat and again one we see because we're very much engaged in trying to help promote that and fan those flames. Mm -hmm. so, um, do we have questions from the audience? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Mohammed Sunusi. I'm with the Islamic Society of North America. Thank you to Rumi Forum. Thank you Max for a wonderful presentation. Uh, we know that tonight the president will address the nation, the State of the Union, and um, you know, according to the, some reports, the job creation is going to be you know, all over the place. So I see here there is a direct connection between job creation and, you know, and the issue of hunger and poverty. So, and this wonderful initiative that the Obama administration actually highlighted in the last couple of years, Feed the Futures and others, do you think he will mention those things in the State of the Union tonight so that, you know, the entire nation knows about it and the world know about it? You're asking me to do something I can't do, Mohammed. You know that. But uh, the great thing is you are absolutely right. The President has a laser focus on uh, the economy, on jobs, on job creation. That will be a very large part of what we're doing. We've seen that at the Department of Agriculture with, with our focus, especially in rural America, where people are uh, harder hit. So the average age is higher, the uh, average median income is lower, there are fewer opportunities that the Department of Agriculture's responsibility around job creation, around economic and community development is uh, figures very large in, in our work that will continue to play a large role in the administration's agenda and what the president is, is planning to highlight. Obviously, working with our partners around the world for a number of different reasons, not just national security, but uh, others, we, there's a need and that will continue. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.